Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 1. We're going to continue uh, on through the book of Romans in our Not Ashamed uh, series here. Uh, so the key verses that we have been looking at have been Romans uh, 1, 16, and 17, which is really what Paul is kind of bringing as a theme to the entire book. And in that he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, or from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now that's the key thought in the whole book here, is that we have a righteousness that is not our own. It is the righteousness of God that God gives us through the power of the gospel when we receive that by faith. So faith is what activates that power to bring about that righteousness that we can earn. It's not anything that we could ever develop in ourselves. It is what has to be given to us by God. And that's the incredible news of the gospel, is that God gives us what we cannot do on our own, and he does that through faith. Now that phrase there, the righteous shall live by faith, is a quote from Habakkuk 2.4. And this is something that Paul will reference at least one other time in his letters, and the writer of Hebrews also references this, that the righteous will live by faith. And there's that strange little expression in there that it is uh, verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now there's been a lot of um, things that have been written about that, trying to figure out exactly what that means because it's kind of an unusual expression. And, And it seems to kind of have that idea of it's all about faith from first to last. Uh, But there's also a sense in that, that it means an ever-increasing, strengthening, growing faith. That we don't just simply come to this righteousness by faith and we leave faith behind, but that as a believer, we constantly live by faith. Day to day, our faith should be an active part of our relationship with God. That we are to be growing in that faith and deepening in that faith. So faith is not a one-time event for a believer, but faith is an ongoing attribute of a believer. It's a characteristic that we ought to be known for. In fact, this is where Paul is going to go. We're going to pick up where we left off in verse 7. And so verse 7, we finally are now getting to the greeting that Paul gives to the Roman church. He says, "...to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints." Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is where we left off. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I might reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles." I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we cannot understand your word apart from the power of the Holy Spirit revealing it to us. And I thank you that you have given us the gift of the Holy Spirit who is to teach us all things and to remind us of everything you said. So now during this time, I pray that your Holy Spirit would run freely in our hearts and minds to better grasp what you're saying about living by faith. And so, God, I pray that you would transform us in this time, that you would speak during this time, you would convict, and that you would make us more into the image of Christ as we go through this. So, Father, speak through me, speak by the power of your Holy Spirit, 
and let that fall on receptive and obedient hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So first, uh, let's jump into verse 8. We see that Paul is thanking God for all the believers in Rome. Now, this is not the Roman Catholic Church. This is just Christians who are in Rome. And it seems to be a predominantly Gentile uh, group that's there. There are some uh, Jewish people that are part of the Roman church. Uh, But at this point, it has already developed into a church that has a lot of Gentile background believers that are in there. And so uh, Paul uh, is first off saying, look, everywhere I go, I'm hearing about your faith. One of the notable things about the church in Rome, and this was not the centerpiece church, it became a very significant church, but at this point, it's just another church. So it's not the hub of everything. Jerusalem is still the hub. Antioch is a close second. They're in uh, Syria, Uh, but Rome is a significant church, but is not by any means the most influential church, but is gaining a notoriety. And what they're notable for is their faith. And that really ought to be the identifying characteristic of any church. That when people talk about Burnville Baptist Church, the thing that they ought to be saying is, man, those are people of faith. Not people of the faith, but people of faith. You see the difference in the two? One is they hold to a dogma of Christianity. They believe biblical things, and that is important. But more than that is that characteristic of trust where, man, when we think about the people at Burnville Baptist Church, we see a people that trust God, they follow God, they believe God, and it shows in their life. They're unshaken by the things of the world because they're trust in God. They are actively seeking what God wants because everything about them is that walk of faith. So in a believer's life, as an individual, and certainly corporately as a church family, The thing that people ought to see in us is a walk and a life of faith. And so the question is, is that Burnville's reputation? Now, don't be quick to answer that. But let that just be something that the Lord mulls in your heart and and ask that question, if not, why not? And and understand that the the body is made up of individual believers. And let the Holy Spirit just work in your heart to ask the question, How am I contributing or not contributing to that faith aspect? So if the entirety of the church's faith were dependent on me, would the church be known as a people of faith? When people look at you individually, just your neighbors, your family, co-workers, anybody that you happen to encounter, when they see your life, do they see someone who is actually a faith-filled person? And so let that be just something that the Lord uh, brings about in you. Because what we have is Paul, who is a, a deep man of faith. He's trusted God through so many different hardships and, and, and so many different circumstances that God has brought his way. But still, all through everything that Paul has faced, there is a, a, an unmitigated joy, unbridled joy for serving the Lord. And he has trusted him all the way. So Paul is a paramount man of faith, and and he is writing to a church that is known about faith. So here are just some things that we see about faith and living a life of faith in this. He says in verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayer, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Faith is loves company. Faith loves the family of faith. Faith loves being around other people who are filled with faith. If you've ever had that that experience in your life, and certainly if you're walking in faith now, you know that it it is something in you that longs to be around people of faith. It, it, it just something that resonates in our hearts that these are people that walk with the Lord and I want to be with him. Paul, in the same way, has been longing to be with the Christians in Rome, hearing about their faith. The man of faith longs to hang out with these people of faith, to see them and meet them in person. Now, by this point, he may have never been there. 
And this is his first journey actually to go get to see the Roman Christians. And he has heard about them, their reputation and what they're like. And he's like, I've been longing to come to see you. Faith loves fellowshipping with other people of faith. And you see that longing that even before he gets there, he is praying for them. Faith loves company. Faith loves the fellowship of the believers. And we see faith expressing itself through prayer for each other and through that longing to be with each other. It is hard to keep people of faith apart. That's been one of the interesting things during all this coronavirus shutdown and, and, and so forth is just to see the struggle of Christians who know we can, we can at least be fed by a, a sermon on, on Facebook or uh, online or some way like that, but it still doesn't satisfy that inner deep longing of faith to be with the fellowship of the believers. And, and that is something that is deep within us, and it is natural for faith to long and gravitate toward that. Verse 11, he says, I long to see you so that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Folks, faith loves to grow. And faith loves to help others grow. There, there is something deep within faith that once we have come to taste and see who God really is, we want to know more. We're not satisfied with just simply a little appetizer of God. We want the full meal deal. And we want to continue that feast and to continue to grow and learn. And that's why Paul talks about this faith to faith aspect, that there's that ever increasing aspect of faith that we have come to know that Jesus is our savior, that God loves us enough to have saved us. And it makes us want to know God more and to grow in our trust of him so that we, we see more of God. And the more that we see of God, the more we trust him. And the more deep we want to go into that trust because we cannot find our satisfaction in anything else. And so it's a, indeed what Proverbs calls an iron sharpening iron that we want to be around other believers because we understand we cannot grow fully in the faith without the family. And that we need to be around other believers because we want to help them grow. We want to encourage each other. We want to strengthen each other. But we also want to be strengthened. And that, man, if I could get around some other believers who could speak things into my life, it would it'd be such a rich benefit to me. And, and there's just a hunger of faith that wants to grow more. It wants to know God more. It wants to know God's word more. It wants to know God's family more. It wants to trust God more deeply. Verse 12, we get into, it says, that is... The reason why I want to impart a spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is that we might be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now, if you've got King James, it's interesting that the word there is comfort. And, and, and this morning I was looking that up because I was reviewing, you know, what, how was ESV that I'm reading out of this morning similar and maybe different in the wording from King James? And there's that word comfort. And I thought, you know, that doesn't seem to capture the Greek word that's there. It seems to be a little soft. And so I'm, I'm thinking, what does the word comfort mean? And so I look it up to look up the roots of it. And, and so I, I, I came from old school English class. And some of you are old enough that you broke it down into the Latin roots. And you've got the root word and you've got the prefix and so forth. And that's actually a helpful tool. I hated my English teachers at the time, but I'm so thankful for it now teaches me how to understand things. And so I'm looking at that word because nowadays when we use it, it means to ease or alleviate distress or pain, doesn't it? I asked Sandy this morning, I said, well, how would you define comfort? She's like, I can't think of any way to say it other than it comforts us. And, and, and I looked and the, the, the root word of comfort is the Latin word fortis or forte. It means strong. Fort Smith is a fort, it's a stronghold. That's what it was built to be originally. And, and whenever Miss Betty is playing through music, she'll see the letter F above a line. And that means forte, it means to play this strong. 
at this point, not soft and daintily, but come across strong with this part of the music. And, and when you put that prefix, come on comfort, it means to completely strengthen. It gives us an intensifying force to the root word strong. And so when Paul is saying this, that word encourage that I have in the ESV, encourage means to stick courage into somebody. You know, it's, it's to give somebody some strength of heart. So the words are really, when King James was translated, comfort means to completely strengthen somebody. It doesn't mean to say, they're there, it's going to be better. They're there. It's to strengthen so that when we're walking in the midst of hard times, we're strong enough to handle that. And it enables us to walk through without fear, without shame, so that we are confident in what we are experiencing. And that's what Paul wants is not weak faith, but strong faith. So faith loves to strengthen other faith. Faith loves to be strengthened and it loves to strengthen others around us because there are a lot of things that can come our way and cause doubt. It can cause distress, but the word of God is powerful and Paul wants to come in to speak some kind of word to them to reveal some truth about Christ so that they are strong in their faith. We Christians are those that have weak theology. Weak faith is based on a weak understanding of who God is and what he has availed to us through his Holy Spirit and through the word. So faith loves to strengthen. Faith loves to encourage. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, let us consider how we can encourage one another day to day to strengthen one another day by day because the days are evil. And, and it also says, and this is, if I ever had my own coffee shop, I would call it He Brews. And, and I would have the theme verse on there as, let us consider how we can stimulate one another, like that word stimulate, caffeine, you know. Let us consider how we can stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And there is just something about the people of faith that we need each other. Because there are so many things that come against faith and challenge faith, but we need the family of faith so that we can encourage and strengthen one another in those times when they're weak and they can do the same for us. It's amazing to see how in my own life, and you've experienced this as well, that you can be walking through something and, and it just seems confusing and it's falling apart and it's like the end of the world, but you have a believer come in and they just say, hey, the Lord just laid this verse on my heart and I felt like it was for you. And it's like the whole perspective changing moment, a brief sharing of the word of God and the difference it makes. Have you ever had that happen? Just say amen. It makes all the difference in the world. We need the family. And the family is here to help us grow and strengthen and deepen in our faith. I love verse 14. It says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. So Greeks and really non-Greeks as the world would know it in that day. Both to the wise and to the foolish. You know what? Anyone can have faith. Paul's mission was global in its context. That basically anybody who is not Jew, and even the Jews, that's who I'm going to first. But basically my mission is anyone in the world. So anyone of any nationality, any background, any intellect level, any education level can have saving faith and be radically transformed by the good news of the gospel. Amen. You don't have to have a PhD to understand the gospel. You don't even have to have a kindergarten education to understand the gospel. The gospel is intended for everyone, for every race, for every nation, for every creed. That is who the gospel is for, and that is what Paul wants to do. I want to bring it to everyone and make it accessible to everyone because anyone, anyone, anyone can have faith. And that means that anyone can receive the power of God 
so that the righteousness of God can be imparted to them. That also means that anyone, anyone, anyone can share the gospel. You don't have to have a seminary PhD. You don't have to have a seminary master's. You don't have to have a day of college, Bible college. You don't even have to have a day of Sunday school to be able to share the good news. If you think about it, two of the greatest evangelists in the gospels were not the apostles. They were the woman at the well and the demoniac in the Gadarenes. Think about it. The woman at the well had had five husbands and now she's living in adultery. And, and, and the amazing encounter that she has is Jesus tells her everything about herself. And somehow through that, she's convinced this is the Messiah. This is the one we've been waiting for. A most uncomfortable moment of having your shame and embarrassment exposed turns into a saving moment for her. It's kind of like sometimes when Jesus would heal somebody, like blind people, he healed them different ways. Sometimes he spit in their eye. Sometimes he spit in the mud and then put that in their eyes. Sometimes when we're encountered with, uh, with the gospel, it feels like Jesus just spit in our eye, doesn't it? And that's not a pleasant thing, but that can be the transforming moment for people where they suddenly see who they are and they see who Jesus is and that makes all the difference in the world. And that woman went and told the entire village. The outcast that she was goes in and convinces them the Messiah is at the well. The gathering demoniac, here's the guy that when Jesus and the disciples get out of the boat, they encounter a man who is naked in chains, covered in bruises and cuts and dirt and filth. The village is afraid of him because they can barely keep him in chains. He would break the chains. He's probably the, kid, uh, the, the, the guy that's living in the graveyard that the kids from the town would dare each other. The boys would say, I dare you to go to the graveyard. But the people were fearful of him. So much so that whenever Jesus cast out the legion of demons that was within him and set him free, the people of the village begged Jesus, go away from us. They understood that there was someone in their midst who was far more powerful than all the demons that inhabited this man. But the man who had been possessed begged Jesus, let me go with you. And Jesus said, no, but go and tell what God has done for you. Jesus goes, he leaves that point, goes back across the lake, goes all the way over to the Mediterranean Sea, goes north a little bit, and then comes back over there. And when he arrives, there is only one person who has ever heard the gospel before, and it was that guy. The only one who had ever met Jesus was that guy guy. And yet when Jesus gets back, such a crowd gathers when they hear that he is there, that the second miraculous feeding takes place where he feeds 4,000. He'd already fed the 5,000 once before, but now in a different location, in a different context, these were pig raising people that if they were Jewish people, they were not good Jewish people. And it is in that context that when he gets there, there's such a crowd that he miraculously feeds 4,000. Why? Because there was one person who had never been to Sunday school, never been to Bible college, but had only had an encounter with Jesus and had faith enough to tell others what Jesus had done for him. Faith loves to tell the gospel. And it's not about your qualification. It is about your encounter with the living Jesus. And that has qualified you to tell. And folks, faith is fed by the gospel. Look at verse 15. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And that's interesting. Because he's addressing them as brothers and sisters. 
They've already got faith. But he is saying, I can't wait to get there. I am eager to come and preach the gospel to you. These are the believers. We tend to think the gospel is only for people outside the church. Folks, the gospel is for us as well. David Bryant is a pastor in uh, New Jersey. He wrote a book called Christ is All. Got to hear him speak when we lived up in New England. And he said the church ought to be evangelizing the church. That we ought to be telling each other the good news of Jesus every single time that we're getting together. The gospel is for believers because faith is fed by the gospel. It continues to grow and deepen as we see the gospel more deeply. As we come to understand more fully what God has done, by, uh, done for us through Jesus on the cross, it makes all the difference in the world and it feeds us. That means that the gospel never, ever gets old for believers. It is always sweet. It is always precious. It is always something that, that just does something inside us that when we hear it, it resonates with our heart all the more and more deeply each time we do. The gospel never, ever gets old. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. You want to unlock the power of God in your world? Share the gospel. Now, my generation and below, uh, we see a lot of superhero movies. Now, those of you who are a little bit older, you had your Superman and things like that. But can you imagine if somebody had the power to make COVID go away from the world, but they wouldn't use that power? What kind of person would we think them to be? If somebody had the power to stand on the Louisiana Gulf Coast and say to Cristobal coming in, stop. And it would not impact in a negative way. Or worse yet, if somebody had had the power to stand before Katrina and say, you cannot come this way. You are done and immediately it dissolved. But if that per person would not use that power, what would we think of that person? Folks, we possess a superpower. And that superpower is the very power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And that power is the gospel. Unleash the power. Let people know what does the world, what does this country need more than anything right now? It is not a different president. It is not a better president. It is not a better speaker of the house. It is not a better Senate. It is not better state and local government. It is not a better police force. What the nation needs is the gospel. And we possess the gospel. So how can we hold it to ourselves at such a time as this? Unleash the power. It's not that you have the power to save. I am powerless to lead anyone to Jesus, but I can open a door for them through the gospel by simply speaking the gospel and watching to see what the Holy Spirit does at that moment. Be bold. Let your faith be strengthened to the point that you are freely sharing the gospel because anyone, anyone, anyone can have faith. Amen? Amen? Amen. Oh, that the Lord would change our hearts, that he would strengthen our faith. And Father, indeed, that is what we come and pray to you today. I pray that you would cause Burnville Baptist Church to be known as a people of faith, that it would be widely reported throughout the land, even as the church in Rome was, that here are people that trust God fully, here are people that if you want to see what faith looks like, look at the people of Burnville Baptist Church. God, I thank you that we cannot manufacture that kind of faith of our own, but I praise you that the Holy Spirit can manifest that faith, and that's what we ask of you today. Oh, that we would have the kind of faith that would amaze you, the kind of faith that the world would see and be drawn to 
Father, I pray that you would give us a growing faith, a faith that loves the fellowship, a faith that is encouraging and encouraged by other believers. And Father, may you indeed unleash the gospel through us. May we trust you enough to do that. God, I praise you that the gospel is available to anyone and that it is available through anyone that has encountered you.